John chapter number nine. John chapter nine, number nine is one of my one of my favorite stories of Jesus when he was uh, here on this earth, walking this earth. We see that that Jesus and his disciples are just walking. They're literally walking, like they're just walking through the town. And the amazing thing about Jesus is that it was never just walking, right? Jesus was always looking for an opportunity to minister. He was always looking for an opportunity to speak into somebody's life, to help somebody. And so for Jesus, it was never just doing something mundane, but it was a ministry opportunity. Even doing something as simple as walking, Jesus is looking and he's aware, trying to see who he can minister to. He was always focused on that. Everything was a ministry opportunity for Jesus. How amazing our lives would be if we viewed every opportunity as a chance to minister. How amazing our lives would be if, if our time on our job where we think I'm just doing something mundane, I'm just punching a time clock, I'm just trying to earn a paycheck. What if we viewed it as an opportunity and prayed before we went to work, God, show me somebody that I need to minister to. Show me somebody that needs to feel your love. Show me somebody that needs to know that you care about them. What if when we came to church, we didn't just come to church thinking I'm just coming to sit on a chair and to just hear something and to leave. What if we came to church and said, God, before I come to church, I want you to show me people that may be there that need to know they're coming in and this is their last lifeline and they feel like nobody cares and nobody loves them and that it's always going to be the way that it's been because what you don't realize is a lot of people come to church hurting and broken. We think everybody comes to church with their act together, but church should really be a hospital where people come and they're able to find that love, not just from Jesus himself, but working through us. What if everything we did, we began to say, what can I do for you, God? What can you minister through me? Who can I show Jesus to? I'm, I'm a big proponent and believer that, that as a pastor, I have the, the least impact and the, le the, the smallest influence out of everybody here because those who go to work and, and you go to the grocery store and you go to that, you have so many people that are there that are just waiting for somebody to come to them and to talk to them. You don't have to be a pastor, you don't have to be a minister, to just find an opportunity to be there, to allow God to use you. And I don't even know why I'm saying all that, but I am, so there it is, it's right there. Somebody needs to be challenged. Your job is not just a job, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. When you go and you have to hang out with people that you don't even wanna hang out with, to hang out with your wife or whatever, it's an opportunity. Jesus was always looking for an opportunity and here he's walking and he finds this opportunity of this man who has been blind since birth and it says in John 9 verse 1 it says as he went along he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him rabbi who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind the disciples thought that something bad meant that he had done something wrong and we do this today too. We think that whenever we see somebody who's going through a difficult time in life, facing a problem, that they must have done something to earn it. We even think with ourselves, like because we're going through something difficult, we start going back through our minds, like what did I do to get myself into this situation? But that's not always the case. Sometimes it is, sometimes if we're honest, we get ourselves into problems, we get ourselves into messes, but then there's times where stuff just happens. And for this man, he's, he's blind. But Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Where are my germaphobes at? You kind of just cringe, right? Like there's a reason I didn't preach this text last year. Like everybody, you know, it's like, oh, it's cringeworthy. I don't care how saved you are. That's gross. I don't care how much you love Jesus. That is nasty. It's nasty. Oh, but it's Jesus' saliva. No, it's gross. 
so gross. But Jesus does it anyways. And it says, go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And this word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seen. And his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claim that he was, others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. I am the man. Jesus is walking with his disciples. He sees this guy begging and he does something absolutely ridiculous. And I know it sounds like I'm probably oversimplifying it, but isn't that really what happened? Jesus is walking. He sees this man. He spits on the mud. He puts it on the guy's eyes and he tells him to go. That's, that's gross. That's weird. That's, that's outrageous. If you don't think it's outrageous, I dare you to try it sometime. Right, go out to a place, of, a public place, spit on, just go up to somebody. Don't even say anything to them. You just go up to them, you spit on the dirt, you rub it together and you put it on their eyes. See what happens. See what, don't tell them you go to Elevation Point Church. I'm just saying, go see. My pastor told me, no, he did not. I'm just saying, if you don't think that's gross, test it out. You'll see, it's, nobody wants that. Nobody likes that. But it's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus goes up to this man and he does something that seems to take his current situation. He's blind, he's begging. His current situation is not the best. Jesus takes this situation and seemingly makes it worse before it ever gets better. He goes and he spits on mud, puts it on the guy's eyes. This makes things worse before things ever actually get better because Jesus is comfortable in our mess. He's comfortable in our mess. He doesn't leave us in our mess. This is where we get it twisted. Jesus is comfortable with it so I can keep doing everything I've been doing. No, Jesus will find you in the mess. He doesn't care about where you're at, but he will find you there and he will take you where you need to be. But Jesus is comfortable in the messy stuff. The stuff we're trying to hide, the stuff we try to pretend isn't there. Jesus is comfortable there. And he's so good at finding us in those moments and taking us and bringing change if we will allow him to. He's comfortable there. But he says, I love you so much that I'm going to take you out of that situation. Jesus does not view your messy areas in your life as a disqualification. He views it as an opportunity. An opportunity to say, look who God is. It's an opportunity. So this morning, I want to talk to you on the subject, the same but changed. The same but changed. If you're watching online, type that in the chat. The same but changed. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for today, and I just thank you for your word. I thank you that we have an opportunity to hear from you. Lord, I pray that that this morning you would help nobody here or online to see or hear from me. God, I pray that you would help them to see and to hear from you. And Lord, may we not stop at hearing, but may we take it and apply it to our lives. I pray that you would minister to us exactly what we need to hear. Help us to hear exactly what it is you have to say to us individually. Because God, you can take one word and speak differently to every single person under the sound of my voice. I pray, Lord, that you would do that. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Now, have you ever had this kind of situation happen to you? Have you ever had somebody mean mug you? You know what I mean? Like give you a mean, nasty look. Anybody by a show of hands, like somebody's mean mugged you? Like for no reason, right? You know, they just gave you a look for absolutely no reason. And this is the kind of thing that bothers me, okay? Because I love people. I love people. I don't just say I love people. And, and, and I don't like for anybody to be mad at me. So I don't like to be mean mugged because I want to know why they're mean mugging me. I'm, I'm kind of like I'm, I'm, a I'm a people pleaser. I'm a recovering people pleaser, right? Like it, it's something where I've grown and, and I've learned you can't make everybody happy. And while I've grown in that and I've come to terms with that, I still at least want to know why, right? Like, like, why are you mad at me? 
My wife can tell you this. Like, we had one time when we were dating, and, and I just, she, she got upset at me, and I just, like, followed her everywhere. Like, why? Why? Why are you mad? Why? 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 She's like, I'm fine. Why? 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 Like, I don't, I want to know why you're mad at me. I, I want to know why you're, you're talking about me. I want to know why you're mean mugging me. Like, I want to know these things because I don't like for people to be mad. I don't like for people to be upset at me. But when I was in 10th grade of high school, I was the victim of a mean mugging, okay, at Six Flags, of all places, right? This is a happy place. I was at Six Flags back when I was younger, and I could ride rides without getting sick, and I'm at Six Flags, and I think it was, uh, I was getting off the ride, I think it's called the Mind Bender or something, it's over by the, the Batman, it's the green one or whatever, I haven't been there in decades, man, um, but anyway, so I'm getting off this ride, and this guy is staring me down, like just the meanest look, and he, like he wanted to hurt me, right? Like he wanted me to die. That's how he's looking at me. And, and so I kind of thought it was in my head, but then the friend that was sitting next to me is like, oh, why is that guy looking at you like he wants to kill you right now? It's like, man, I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. And so I was trying to find the purpose of why he was mean mugging me, and, and then I, I couldn't figure it out. And I was too afraid to go and to ask him because he's like a big dude and he's older than me. So I just didn't even want to go over there. I honestly think the fact that I was a minor that day might have saved my life. I think if I'd have been an adult, he would have taken me on. Because uh, one of my other friends, when I start thinking it's in my head, my other friend who was sitting back behind him comes over and is like laughing hysterically. And he says, hey, man, you see that guy over there pointing to the mean mugging guy? And I'm like, yeah, what's his deal? He's like, dude, somebody spit and it landed on his wife's face at the end of the ride. And I suddenly knew the purpose of the mean mugging. I suddenly realized why he was mean mugging me. Because see, I was young and dumb. And I'm also really bad at science and physics and gravity and that kind of stuff. So we were getting to the end of the ride and I spit up into the air because I thought if I spit in the air, it'd be a cool trick. That it'd go in the air and it would like suspend in the air and we would all go under and then it would come down after we all went under. But apparently... The law of physics, gravity, whatever it is, doesn't work that way. And so it legit went like this and then just landed right in her face. And so I finally, I figured out, like, that's the purpose of why this guy is me mugging me. And y'all are judging me for that. Y'all did some more crazy things when you were in 10th grade of high school. I don't even want to hear it. But I was like, okay, I get it now. I found the purpose. And the first thing I need you to write down this morning is that you got to find the purpose. You got to find the purpose. Type it in the chat. Find the purpose. Whenever something happens in our lives, whenever we're faced with adversity, whenever we're faced with pain, we, we want to find the purpose. We want to know why it's happening. We want to know why we're going through what we're going through. We want to know why we're experiencing what we're experiencing. Is this not true? If we're faced with something, don't we want to know why? On our job. Why is this happening to me, God? I'm doing everything right. I've been checking every box. I've even, I've even thrown it back. Look at everybody in here today. I've thrown it back. I'm back to church in person. God, I went to church in the building. I've done everything right. Like, I'm doing everything. Why is stuff still happening to me? We always want to find the, the purpose. And it's the first step to figuring out what's going on in our lives. It said in verse Number three, Jesus told his disciples, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. No doubt this guy was struggling. He, he's been facing the same pain, the same frustration, the same problem for all of these years. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, there's a purpose for the pain. In other words, there's a reason 
for the pain. There is a plan for the pain. The guy wasn't going through it for absolutely no reason. The guy wasn't going through it because he had done all these things wrong. Jesus said, listen, I want you to understand. He's going through what he's going through so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And so many of us are always praying and asking God to use us, but we don't want him to use us that way. We're praying, God, use me in a big way. God, use me in a mighty way. God, I'm your vessel. You can spit in my eyes if you want to. You can do whatever you want. But then when adversity comes, that is there to help move us into the place we're supposed to be to do what God has called us to do, we become upset because, God, I want you to use me, but I don't want you to use me the way that you want to use me. I want you to use me, but I, God, I don't want to be in, in, in a little position. I want to be in a big position. God, I don't want to be somewhere frivolous. I want to be in a major position. But don't you realize Joseph started in the pit? Joseph didn't just go straight to the palace, but we don't want the pit. I just want the palace. God, use me, but I want everything to go smooth the entire time. And God's like, listen, the things that are happening in your life that you've been cursing, that you've been complaining about, that you've been bickering about, that you've been pray planning about, that's a word I made up. If you're new, that means I'm praying, but I'm really complaining. I'm praying to God, but it's just a complaint. If you've been pray planning about these things, God's saying the very things you're pray planning about, complaining about, frustrated about, are the very things I'm trying to use to do what you've been asking me to do all along. The very things I'm trying to use. There is a purpose for the pain. If you've been facing the same pain, the same problem, the same setback, the same insecurity, the same uncertainty, there is a purpose. There is a purpose in the pain. The pain is not there to take you out. The pain is there so that the works of God may be displayed in you. There is a purpose. If the man would not have been blind, then he would not have had this encounter with Jesus. If he wouldn't have had this encounter with Jesus, then he wouldn't have had his testimony. He wouldn't have had the testimony that he was able to have after the encounter that he had with Jesus. What about this? If Jesus wouldn't have gone through the pain of the cross, then we never would have had salvation. See, it had to happen. The pain had to happen. The frustration had to happen. The uncertainty, it had to happen. There is a purpose. Somebody say, there's a purpose. Type in the chat, there is a purpose. There's a purpose. I wish I could tell you today that as long as you serve Jesus, everything will always be okay. As long as you follow after Jesus, everything will always be perfect. Everything will always be wonderful. As long as you live for him, everything will be great. But the reality is that's not true. It's not true. As long as you follow Jesus, it doesn't mean that everything is perfect all the time. And I I love you too much to lie to you. Because so many of us have had people for our entire lives tell us, well, if you just follow after Jesus, everything will be okay. If you just follow after Jesus, everything will be perfect. If you just follow after Jesus, there won't be any problems. There won't be any adversity. There won't be any setback. But the reality is you can do all the things right. You can pray. You can read the Bible. You can tell others about Jesus. You can come to church. You can come to the fiesta on Friday night. And I hope that you do. You can do all these things, all these great things. But it doesn't mean there won't ever be pain. It doesn't mean there will never be frustration. And the reason that so many people fall out of church and fall out of serving God is because it's not what they signed up for because they were fed a lie in the beginning. I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for life to be easier. But what you don't realize is the more that you do for God, the more difficult your life will be. Because the more you're doing for God, the more the enemy has to fight. The more the enemy's trying to stop. The more that you do, the more pain there may be. So all I'm trying to say is be careful what you ask for. If you aren't ready to give it all for him, don't ask him to use you in whatever way he wants to use you. Because there's pain. But the amazing thing is there is purpose 
in the pain. See, I'm not saying there won't be pain, but what I am saying is as long as you follow Jesus, there is purpose and there is a plan in the pain. There is a purpose and there is a plan in the uncertainty, in the frustration, in the difficulty. The bad news is there's, there's gonna be pain. The good news is as long as you're with Jesus, there's a purpose to get you to where he was trying to take you. And somebody needs to know that the reason you've been going through what you've been going through is because God knows that you have what it takes to withstand it. The reason you've been going through and facing what you've been facing is because God knows you have the, re- the, the, the ability to withstand it. He knows that you have the potential. But guess what? So does the devil. So does the devil. That's why he fights you so hard. Because if there was nothing in you, he would have nothing to fight against. And what a shame it would be for the devil to believe more in our potential than we do. What a shame it would be for the enemy to see more value in us than we see in ourselves. What a shame it would be for the enemy to to believe in us more than we believe in ourselves. To think that we were more powerful than we think ourselves. He sees more potential in many of us than we see in ourselves because we allow our shame, we allow our guilt, we allow our uncertainty, the things we've done, the past mistakes, we allow all of that to tell us that because of what we've done, because it's always been this way, it'll always be that way. But God is saying, None of that matters. None of that matters. None of the the shame, none of the guilt, none of the frustration, none of the mistakes, none of that matters. As long as you are a son or a daughter of God, you have exactly what it takes. You have exactly what it takes. The man, he found the purpose. Jesus is like, listen, you got a purpose with the pain that you've been going through. It happened for a reason. It happened with a purpose. So the works of God might be displayed in you. And after he found the purpose, Jesus told him, okay, now I need you to move with purpose. I need you to move with purpose. Write that down, move with purpose. Verse six, it said, after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sin. Go. Jesus told him, go. In other words, he said, move. Got mud on your face? Big disgrace? Now move. Move. He said, I want you to go. And and what's amazing... Jesus didn't even tell him he was going to do it. Did you, I mean, do you notice this? He he didn't give the guy a warning. He just walked up to him. He's like, oh, this man's blind. He needs help. I'm going to spit on the ground. I'm going to rub it around, and I'm going to put it on the guy's face. The dude is minding his own business, just sitting there like he always does, asking for help. And out of nowhere, he gets lambasted in the face with spitty mud. Didn't even see it coming. Didn't have a clue it was going to happen. And isn't that the frustrating part most of the time? Is that we don't even realize it's going to happen. Isn't that the frustrating part is, is that so often we get blindsided. It's like... God, if I could have at least known it was going to happen, then I could have planned for it. God, if I could have at least known it was going to happen, I could have prepared for it. I could have gotten ready for it. But it just happened. Out of nowhere, it just happened. It just took place. If I could have known that the heartbreak was going to happen, then I could have prepared for it. If I could have known that that the pain was going to happen, then I could have prepared for it. If I could have known that the frustration in the career was going to happen, I could have prepared for it. If I could have known that the people on that business were going to turn around and stab me in the back, I could have prepared for it. But the fact that we didn't know is what makes it so frustrating and so painful. Because it came out of nowhere. 
But if God told you it was going to happen, then you probably never would have done it. If God let you know it was going to happen, then you probably never would have even done the thing that God was wanting you to do. And so many of us are stuck in the mess that we're in because we're like, listen, my life is messy enough without adding on some extra mud. My, my life is messy enough without adding on some extra problems. And so many of us are staying stuck where we're at because of our unwillingness to move with the mess. We're, we're unwilling to move until everything is fixed, until everything is better. We're sitting there, we got mud on our face, and we're like, okay, I'll go wash, but first get this off of me. First heal me. First do what it is I need you to do. And we're not willing to move until we see what it is that we're believing for. We're not willing to take the step until we see what it is that we've been waiting for, that we've been trusting in, that we've been relying on. We don't want to go anywhere with the mess. We don't want to have to move with the mess. But Jesus puts mud on the guy's face and then tells him, I want you to go. I want you to go. And from the outside looking in, it looks like a man with a mess, right? It looks like a mess. It looks like a problem, but it was actually a miracle in motion. It was a miracle in motion. What Jesus was doing in this moment, he wasn't just making the guy's life worse for no reason. He, he was putting mud on his eyes so that he could lead him to the miraculous. See, it doesn't matter how uncertain your life looks right now. There is a miracle in your movement. There is a breakthrough in the breakdown. There is joy in the morning. But you have to learn to do what the man did. You have to learn how to move with purpose. Move with purpose. Take a step with purpose. In everything that we're doing, we're moving with purpose. You have to be willing to move with the mess. Be willing to move with the pain. Be willing to move with the uncertainty. To be willing to move with the insecurity. To be willing to move with the questions. I don't know if you're like me. I want every question answered before I move. I want to know where it's coming from. I want to know how it's going to happen. I want to know how God's going to do it. I want to know all of this stuff. But God is like, I need you to move, and then you'll figure it out. You've got to move with purpose. Be willing to say, I'm going to go even when I don't understand it. Because when it's all said and done, you will see what you've never seen before. See, it wasn't, it wasn't the mud that brought the miracle, it was his ability, to, his willingness to move. It wasn't the mud on his face that healed him, it was his willingness to move. And so many of us, we get so bogged down and focused on the mess that we stop moving. We get so focused on the mistakes, the problem, that we stop moving. We get so focused on the disqualifications that we stop moving. But it wasn't the mud, it was the the movement. He came to this spot and he was blind and he couldn't see and it seemed like he had no purpose. But then God told, Jesus told him to go. Put mud on his face, told him to go. And when he came back, he was able to reveal the purpose. Because see, the reality is there is a purpose and many of us know the purpose, but we never reveal the purpose. And that's the last thing I need you to see today is reveal the purpose. Reveal the purpose. Somebody say reveal the purpose. In verse 8, he said, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was, and others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. I am the man. Notice, though, they did not recognize him based on his condition. They recognized him based on his action. They didn't look, look, at, look, they didn't say, isn't this the man who was blind? They said, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? They didn't say, isn't this the man who was blind? They said, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? They were trying to bring him back to the place 
where he once was. Listen, don't allow anybody else to take you back to the place where you were. I don't care how many times they call you, how many times they text you, how many times they email you, Snapchat you, message you, whatever it may be. We're not going back to the place where God rescued me from. I'm not going back to that position. I'm not going back to the thing that I once was. You can look at your circumstances in one of two ways. You can look at it as something God is doing to move you forward, or you can look at it as something that's going to hold you back. And so many times people want to bring you back to where you were. But God is saying, I want you to help bring them forward to where you are. I want you to let them see you're the same, but you're changed. You're the same person, but there's been a change. Our oldest son, Judah, he's going to be four in October, and he's kind of in this phase now where he's just, he's smart, and he he tests the waters, right, because he can. He knows how to. And his new thing that he had started doing, it was very, very short-lived. But this thing he started doing was sticking his tongue out at you. Whenever he was getting in trouble, he would just look at you and go. So I was watching him one day, and he did it to me like four times. And I said, Judah, if you do it again, you're going to get in trouble. And he did it again. And he got in trouble. A couple days later, Nicole was getting onto him for something, and I saw him stick his tongue out at her. So he got in trouble. It's like, dude, we're not doing that game. We're not playing that game. The next morning, I was getting him up, getting him ready to go to his grandparents' house. And he was in this great mood, and he looks at me, and he just sticks his, he's like, Meh. like sticks his tongue out, but like in a silly way, right? Like in a fun way. Like he, he was, It wasn't an attitude. He wasn't in trouble. He just sticks his tongue out at me. And I, so I wasn't even going to say anything because I'm like, he's just, he's just having fun. But before I could have even said anything, he sticks his tongue out and he immediately says, Daddy, Daddy, I'm just being silly. I'm just sticking my tongue out to be silly. Just sticking my tongue out to be silly. In other words, he's saying like, I'm doing the same thing, but there's a different purpose. See, the man came back to where he was and he said, listen, I'm the same, but I'm changed. I'm in the same place, but I am in the same place for a new purpose. My purpose has changed. He said, listen, I used to come here and to beg, but now I've come here to testify. I used to come here to ask for things, but now I've come here to tell you of things. I used to come here and beg for help, but now I've come to point you to the one who can actually bring the help. I'm the same one, but I'm changed. I'm the same person, but I'm changed. I'm in the same place, but my purpose has changed. I'm the same, but I'm changed. Forget about God using your, turning your mess into a message. What if your mess is the message? What if the mess is the message? The mess that says, this would have taken somebody else out, but I'm still standing. What if the the, the mess is there to say, listen, somebody else would have quit, but I'm still here. What if the mess is there to say somebody else would have given up because they didn't understand it, but I found the purpose. I found the purpose for what I was going through. And the purpose is to point you to him. The purpose is to let you know that I'm not going to stay where I was. God's taking me to a new place. You don't have to stay where you are. God can take you to a new place. What if the mess that you see yourself in or that you saw yourself in? Many of us have been sitting on a testimony for too long. We've been sitting on it for too long. God gave us a story to tell and we've been sitting on it for too long. What if the thing that you thought was too messy that nobody else ever needed to know about was the very thing God gave you so that you could come back and say, hey, listen, you see me? I'm the same person. I've come back. Not, listen, I'm not like all cool. I'm not above everybody else. I've come back. But I need you to see I'm changed. My purpose has changed. I hear I, I have a new purpose. God gave me a new purpose. I'm able to come back to the same place and to minister to the ones who were there for me. 
I'm able to come to the same place and to help those who were there for me. I'm able to let you know you gave me money five years ago and I appreciate it. But let me point you to the one who can help you more than money ever could. Let me, you got a sickness in your life? I'm going to give you something better than the money you gave me. I'm going to point you to Jesus. I'm going to let you know of the one who can bring healing. I'm going to let you know of the one who can heal your marriage. I'm going to let you know of the one who can help your job. I'm going to let you know of the one who can save your business. I'm going to let you know of the one who can turn it all around. Let me come back to the same place I was, let you see I'm the same person, but I'm changed now because I found the purpose. The thing I complained about, the thing I griped about, the thing I cried about was the very thing that was in my life for such a time as this. It wasn't there to take me out, but it was there to reveal my purpose. It was there to show me that everything I've been through, God had a reason.